my name is Jeremy Wall, and I'm a professorial fellow at the School of Physics in this uh, university. Uh, and I want to welcome you to the third in our series of uh, International Year of Astronomy uh, July lectures. And it's my job to, and my pleasure to introduce our speaker of this evening, Dr. Michael Brown of Monash University. Uh, Michael did his uh, science degree and his PhD uh, at the University of Melbourne. Uh, he then moved on to a Henry Norris Russell uh, Fellowship at Princeton <coughs> University. Uh, he spent time at the uh, US National Optical Astronomy Observatory uh, in Tucson, Arizona, uh, before taking up his present position uh, as a lecturer at the School of Physics at Monash University. So it's uh, a great pleasure to uh, uh, welcome Michael, who's going to tell us, um, uh, having in the previous lectures dealt with uh, Galileo's telescope and the Hubble telescope, Michael's going to tell us about uh, Australia's next large optical telescope project. Pleasure to be here this evening. Before I get started, uh, can I ask people to uh, remember to turn their mobile phones off? Um, thankfully, this theatre has very little uh, radio uh, reception, but uh, it's always a distraction to have one phone go off. So, it's an enormous pleasure to be here to present the John John Telescope, 400 plus 10 years after. Galileo as part of the International Year of Astronomy, which commemorates, celebrates, and educates 400 years of the use of telescopes to study celestial objects. What is the giant Magellan Telescope? It is going to be one of the next generation of extremely large optical and near-infrared telescopes, which will study celestial objects over much of the age of the universe. It is far larger than the current generation of telescopes. The largest telescopes currently available to astronomers at optical and infrared wavelengths have mirrors approximately 8 metres in diameter. The Giant Magellan Telescope will use seven of these mirrors simultaneously operating as a single telescope with an aperture equivalent to a telescope 22 metres in diameter, truly enormous in size. The telescope will be able to achieve an angular resolution of 0.01 seconds of arc. This compares to most telescopes observing today, which are limited to around about one arc second. 0 0.01 seconds of arc is about three millionths of a degree. So it's a truly extraordinary angular resolution. The engineering feats required to build a telescope are quite significant. The moving components of the telescope, the telescope itself, the enclosure it sits within, are going to weigh in at a mere thousand tonnes. Even the instrumentation which is attached to the telescope is going to be enormous in its scale. There'll be some instruments that are on the back of the telescope that can weigh as much as 10 or 20 tonnes, cameras, uh, spectrographs, etc. And obviously this does not come particularly cheaply. The budget is going to be approximately 700 million US dollars. So to understand why we need a telescope like GMT, it's sort of interesting to look back on the history of telescopes and how they've progressed over the last 400 years. So here's a couple of images of Galileo's telescopes. You can tell they're really old because the photograph's black and white. <laughs> <laughs> the telescopes that Galileo used used spherical glass lenses um, with a clear aperture of one or two centimeters, so comparable to a, a very small set of binoculars. The detector was the human eye, and with 
such telescopes, one could see objects about a factor of 10 fainter than what the unaided eye can see. Objects that are around about magnitude 10, uh, magnitude 8, I should say, in the uh, parlance of astronomers. And they can achieve magnifications on the order of 3 to 30 times, which is similar again to a pair of binoculars. With these telescopes, Galileo achieved great things. He observed the features on the moon for the first time. He observed the phases of Venus, which are analogous uh, to the phases of the moon. And he observed satellites of Jupiter, the moons of Jupiter, orbiting around Jupiter. Here is um, a little bit of his logbook. Um, undergraduates, uh, uh, undergraduates may note that um, he wasn't the cleanest note taker, you know, no units, scales, where's the dates, um, etc, etc. But the general gist is there and so we give him high marks. You can see the moons of Jupiter on moving around the planet on various sides. Sometimes we only see three of the moons, presumably because one of the moons was either in front or behind Jupiter at the time. And indeed, one can see similar things uh, with a good set of uh, binoculars uh, these days, uh, just from the suburbs. One can advance the technology somewhat by using a larger lens to collect more light, so one can see um, fainter objects. And one can also crank up the magnification somewhat by using a eyepiece with a smaller focal length or using a telescope with a longer focal length, um, such as uh, this uh, telescope here, the uh, Yerkes refractor, which has a one metre uh, diameter lens. It's the largest refractor ever built and an extremely long focal length, um, at least 10 metres. Um, for scale, there's this guy here who some of you may be familiar with. The technology of refracting telescopes, however, has its limitations. The lenses are made of glass and you can approximate a spherical lens if you really want to uh, with um, two triangles and some of you may be familiar with what a triangle of, of glass does. It splits light up into its component colours. Consequently, while one can build uh, refracting telescopes that using multiple lenses that do have fairly good behaviour um, as a function of colour. For very simple telescopes, including the ones that Galileo used, the light at various wavelengths or various colours does not get brought to a common focus and this is a limitation of telescopes using refracting optics. Later in the 17th century, Isaac Newton refined the design of telescopes, advanced the design of telescopes significantly by introducing the reflecting telescope. A copy of one of his telescopes is shown here. The reflecting telescope behaves in some respects like a refracting telescope. It takes light from distant celestial objects and focuses it to a point at the focal plane, but instead of using a glass lens and refraction, it uses a curved mirror and reflection to bring the light to a, to a focus. And the advantage of a reflecting telescope is that reflection does not vary uh, with colour, and so you do not have the chromatic aberration that is common with uh, refracting telescopes. And indeed, most of the large telescopes that have been used over the last 200 years or so um, are reflecting telescopes. Herschel's famous telescopes which were used uh, to survey uh, both the northern and southern sky. The Anglo-Australian telescope, a four metre diameter uh, mirror is inside the Anglo-Australian telescope and this is the largest optical telescope available in Australia. Even Parkes radio telescope is a reflecting telescope. The DISH is a parabola which reflects radio waves up towards the focus cabin and the largest optical and infrared telescopes in the world are reflecting telescopes. The Gemini North telescope shown here and one of the Keck telescopes shown here. These very large telescopes allow us to collect a large amount of light and see objects that are in some cases um, a million, ten million times fainter than what the unaided eye can see. However, there are some limits to what we can do with these telescopes. In particular, we can't just arbitrarily 
crank up the magnification for a couple of reasons. If we look at a distant star with a telescope, um, and it's a reasonably small telescope and it's a very good night, what we might see is something that looks a little bit like the following. Instead of seeing the disk of the star and maybe its sunspots, instead what we see is we see a fuzzy blob like this, surrounded by a faint ring. This fuzzy blob and faint ring are not physically associated with the star. What they are, are an artifact of the telescope and the fact that light has wave-like properties and what we're seeing is a diffraction pattern, a pattern produced by the constructive and destructive interference of light when it passes through an aperture. This diffraction pattern is very much analogous to the diffraction pattern that one might see if one observes a light source like a laser that is shone through a narrow slit, which is something that um, occurs, I think some people might have done it in uh, uh, their physics experiments at high school uh, and also in undergrad. When you shine a light through a slit, you get this series of spots, you get a bright spot and then a series of fainter spots. When you shine the light from a distant star through a circular aperture, Instead of getting a series of lines like you do from a slit, when you, when you shine the light through a circular aperture, instead what you get is a series of uh, diffraction patterns that are in a circle, known as the airy rings. The angular scale of this ring is given by this equation here, which I promise is the only equation that will be in the talk tonight. Sine theta equals 1.22 lambda on d, where theta is the angular scale, lambda is the wavelength of light, which is around about half a micron or so, and d is the diameter of the aperture, which for an amateur telescope might be on the order of 10 centimetres in size, maybe more if you're a bit ambitious. For this combination, half a micron or so, and a 10 centimetre telescope, the size of the airy ring corresponds to around about one second of arc, or about a 36 hundredth of a degree. That means that if you had two stars separated by a second of arc on the sky, you would be able to clearly tell them apart. You would see two bright spots separated by about that much and you'd be able to distinguish those objects. Similarly, you'd be able to see surface features on planets on that scale, um, or be able to look at the distribution of stars in the galaxy on that scale. However, on smaller scales, you wouldn't be able to split them apart. For instance, if it was 0.1 arc seconds, these two patterns would be so close together it would be hard to distinguish the two stars from each other. However, one can see that one can improve the angular resolution by cranking up the diameter of the telescope. Crank up the diameter of the telescope by a factor of 10 and you should improve the angular resolution by a factor of 10. Crank it up by a factor of 100 and it should improve by a factor of 100. So what happens when we do this with very large telescopes? We get something that looks a little bit like this. This is a series of images taken at video frame rates from a large telescope and what we're seeing here is instead of seeing lots of little dots with little airy rings, little diffraction patterns, what we see is individual stars being broken up into sort of lumps, a bit of a blur around them and we see the images of the stars wandering around. Why is this happening? Why, what is going wrong here? Well, Isaac Newton, 300 or so years ago, knew what was going on. The air through which we look upon the stars is in perpetual tremor, as may be seen by the tremulous motion of shadows cast from high towers and by the twinkling of the fixed stars. The only remedy is a most serene and quiet air, such as may perhaps be found on the tops of the highest mountains above the grosser clouds. What Isaac Newton is saying 
is that the motion of the air in the Earth's atmosphere is blurring the images. It's moving the images of the stars around. And as a consequence, we can't see as much detail as we would like with our large telescopes. Isaac Newton also suggests a solution placing telescopes above some of the turbulence in the atmosphere by plonking them on the highest mountains. And indeed, many of the telescopes, the large telescopes in the world are placed on very high mountains. <coughs> For example, the Gemini telescope and the two Keck telescopes that I showed before are on Mauna Kea, a four kilometre high shield volcano in the Hawaiian Islands, which is hopefully dormant. <laughs> so, even if we place our telescopes on top of these mountains, we are still within the atmosphere. There's not much atmosphere as any astronomer who's been up to Mauna Kea will tell you, but we're still beneath a significant fraction of the atmosphere. And so while it mitigates this issue somewhat, it doesn't eliminate it entirely. So one solution, which has been discussed in a previous lecture, is to truly place your telescope above the grosser clouds and to place it in orbit. This is imagery video from the last Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission, which gives you a sense of how large the Hubble Space Telescope is, about the size of an interstate bus or truck, and it weighs in at 20, 20 tonnes and has a mirror 2.3 metres wide. And this telescope is able to um, achieve diffraction limited imaging because it doesn't have the blurring effects of the atmosphere. This servicing mission, in fact this point of the servicing mission, which Jeremy Mould may recognise, is the removal of the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2, which is an instrument that Jeremy played a very significant role in, and the instrument that he used to measure the expansion of the universe with um, unprecedented precision. The Hubble Space Telescope has been repaired now and will provide hopefully another half dozen, maybe more years of service and it can achieve certain things that ground-based telescopes cannot, but it does have certain limitations. It's only 2.3 metres in diameter, for instance, and we are able to build telescopes much larger than this. However, we can't put telescopes too much larger into orbit. We need, if we're going to launch a telescope into orbit, we need to be able to fit it inside a rocket. The Herschel Space Telescope, which was recently launched, has a four metre diameter mirror and the James Webb Space Telescope, which will be launched in the next decade, has a six metre diameter mirror. But we don't have the means at the moment to launch eight metre mirrors, 10 metre mirrors, 22 metre mirrors into orbit. We just don't have the technology, we just don't have uh, the catch, to be honest, as well. So we're stuck with images from large telescopes that might look something like this. This is a photo negative image um, of a bright star. And instead of getting a nice image of a star with an airy ring uh, around it, instead what we have is a blur with a series of spots known as speckles. What astronomers realised in the 1960s and 1970s was that each of these little speckles is in fact a diffraction limited image of the star in question. And if one could shift the speckles and move them to a common point, one could achieve the diffraction limited imaging that large telescopes promise. In the last decade or so, maybe two decades at a pinch, Astronomers have been employing techniques that should be able to achieve the diffraction limited Im imaging that they're after with large telescopes. So what astronomers are trying to do is they're trying to get those speckles which are usually spread around in a fuzzy blob, the better part of an arc second in size, and moved into a common point. <coughs> so what they realise is that each of the speckles is effect effectively coming from a little turbulent patch of the atmosphere around about 
10 centimetres in size, give or take. And so instead of sending all of the light from the telescope straight to a science camera, what they do is they send light from different parts of the telescope mirror to something called a wavefront sensing camera, which takes the light from one part of the mirror and focuses it, and so it gets an image of one little speckle. Another beam of light here shown in blue, producing another speckle. And they measure the positions of these speckles around about 30 times or more every single second. They can then determine how they need to shape a mirror, a deformable secondary or tertiary mirror, change the shape of the mirror just subtly to correct the position of the speckles so that they all line up on top of each other and you get a diffraction limited image. Effectively, another way of thinking of it is that they're repairing the wave fronts from the distant star that get crumpled by the turbulent layers in our atmosphere. So, with adaptive optics using a deformable mirror, one can go from images of stars that might look like this on the left, and this is just showing the shape of the wavefront coming in, to images that look like this on the right, where you have a wavefront that's almost uniform and you have a very nice diffraction pattern with classic airy rings around it. This technology is just maturing right now and is being employed on the current generation of large telescopes. An example of the imagery produced with adaptive optics is shown here. This image is from the giant Keck telescopes in Hawaii, or one of the Keck telescopes I should say, um, and it shows a nearby star with some Henry Draper number and two brown dwarfs that are in orbit around that star. The brown dwarfs are a binary system, um, they're orbiting around each other and they're orbiting around this star. Brown dwarfs are sort of somewhere between planets and stars and their size. They're thousands of times the mass of the Earth rather than hundreds of times the mass of the Earth. And one can see that both of the images of the brown dwarfs here have nice little airy rings as we would expect from diffraction limited imaging. So, in the space of 400 and a bit years, we progressed from Galileo's telescopes to the giant Magellan telescope, from glass lenses, one or two centimetres in size, to mirrors effectively 22 metres in diameter. I should also mention that the detectors we're using these days have obviously improved. We've gone from the human eye, which can detect about 2% of the light that is incident upon it, to CCD detectors, digital detectors, which in fact are um, pretty similar to the detectors that you might have in the uh, camera of your mobile phone. These detectors, when used in astronomical applications, can detect up to 80% of the light that is incident upon them. And we've gone from viewing stars that are a factor of 10 fainter than what the eye can see to stars that are on the order of 10 billion times fainter than what the unaided eye can see. Galileo's telescope, 3 to 30 times magnification. If we could place an eyepiece on the giant Magellan telescope while it had adap adaptive optics running, we'd be able to achieve around about 20,000 times magnification. For comparison, most telescopes that are used on Earth today, you're limited to maybe a little bit over 200 times magnification. Maybe you can push it to 300 on a really good night. To give you a sort of visual idea of how things are improving just over the past few decades, we can go and look at some simulated images of a globular cluster, a cluster of stars in the galaxy Centaurus A, which is around about 10 million light years from Earth. Centaurus A uh, is one of the sort of favourite objects of the uh, amateur astronomer. Um, it sort of looks a little bit like the Hungry Jacks logo uh, if you uh, take a look at it with the dust lane uh, replacing the padding. 
This cluster of stars can be seen with Hubble and you can get some indication of the sort of lumpiness of it that is coming from individual stars, but it would be hard to derive the properties of individual stars. Once adaptive optics is working routinely on the Gemini telescope, one should be able to achieve images like this, and one should be able to determine some of the properties of individual stars, at least the brighter ones in the outer part of the cluster. But the view really does change when you shift to the GMT, where you are able to resolve many, many stars, and you'll be able to determine the colours of their stars, the luminosities of those stars, and this will provide you with information about how old this cluster is and its composition, and will provide you with a bounty of information about not just how this cluster formed, but how Centaurus A itself formed. The GMT and other telescopes are also time machines. The speed of light is only so fast. And as a consequence, this allows us to look into the past. If we're looking across this room, we're looking at things as they happened nanoseconds or so ago. If we look further afield, if we look at the moon, we're seeing it as it was about a second ago because light travels at a mere 300,000 kilometres every second. If we look at the nearby planets, we're looking at them as they were minutes ago. If we look at the outer planets of the solar system, a couple of hours ago, nearby stars, a few years ago. We can look at nearby galaxies 100,000 years ago. The light has taken 100,000 years to travel to us. It's 100,000 light years away. GMT will be able to observe galaxies 13 billion light years from Earth. We'll be able to see galaxies 13 billion years ago. This is a tremendous time machine. It allows us to look through 95% of the history of the universe. And this is an incredibly powerful tool for astronomy. It allows us to achieve a plethora of science goals. Things such as studying dark matter and dark energy by, say, looking at the varying expansion rate of the universe over cosmic time. It allows us to look at the first generation of stars, galaxies and quasars at redshift 10, 13 billion light years from Earth. It allows us to probe how gas between the galaxies, the intergalactic medium, has evolved over cosmic time with large-scale structure and the contamination of the galactic medium by the products of stars. It allows us to study the formation of galaxies and their assembly and evolution over cos cosmic time, including the evolution of galaxies similar to our own Milky Way. And it allows us to study supermassive black holes. Supermassive black holes include quasars, which are powered by material in falling towards a black hole, and will allow us to study supermassive black holes in nearby galaxies where we can study the stars in rapid orbit around those objects. To achieve these science goals, a series of instruments will be attached to the back of the Giant Magellan Telescope. This includes spectrographs, which can observe many celestial sources simultaneously, perhaps a plethora of galaxies, 8 billion light years from Earth. A series of high-resolution spectrographs, which can be used to study uh, uh, stars in great detail, including looking for the motion of stars induced by planets orbiting them. And it has a series of images which will be able to exploit the adaptive optics of the GMT to study galaxies in unprecedented detail and to image planets around nearby stars. GMT will have a great gain in sensitivity over the current generation of telescopes. And the sensitivity goes as either the diameter of the telescope D or the diameter of the telescope squared. So in some cases, we'll be achieving an improvement of a factor of three in sensitivity on the current generation of telescopes. In other cases, we'll be improving on the current generation of telescopes by a factor of 10 or so. Such a 
Gain in sensitivity will allow us to see certain things for the very first time. For example, we'll be able to study clusters of stars in the early universe. These two images show a simulation of star formation in the early universe and a corresponding infrared image showing redshifted helium-2 line emission. We can see clusters of stars forming in a proto-galaxy and by studying such objects as a function of cosmic time we can study their growth via both star formation and via mergers of galaxies. We can also study the relationship between these galaxies and the medium in which they reside, see how these stars are ionising the gas around them from the vast amount of UV photons produced by young stars. We don't just detect these clusters of stars in proto-galaxies in the early universe, we can also determine something about the nature of their properties. For example, how bright these objects appear is going to depend on the relationship between these objects and the intergalactic medium, how much gas is ionised um, by photons escaping from these star clusters. The amount of light we see and also the colours that we see are going to also depend somewhat on the nature of the stars. It is thought that stars in the very early universe may be far more massive than the stars that we see today. It's thought that some stars in the very early universe formed out of hydrogen and helium alone could reach masses 300 to 1,000 times the mass of the Sun. Truly massive stars. And if those stars exist, we should see evidence for them in the GMT imagery. But GMT can also be used to study dark energy and dark matter in the universe by studying the varying expansion rate of the universe. We live in an expanding universe, as many of you know, and in such a cosmology, the further an object is from us, the faster away it's moving from us. And we can measure how fast objects are moving away from us by measuring their redshift. If we can measure the distances to objects over much of cosmic time and measure how fast they appear to be moving away from us, we can measure the history of cosmic expansion and we can see how the expansion rate of the universe, parameterized by the Hubble not so constant, is varying over cosmic time. And type 1a supernovae, the explosions of white dwarfs, allow us to do this over a large chunk of the history of the universe. These two images here show a very distant galaxy, in this case image with the Hubble Space Telescope, which has a supernova go off within it. This image is rather limited, so I'll show you a somewhat closer image of a Type 1a supernovae. It's quite a dramatic explosion. Note that the scale here is changing quite dramatically in terms of the size of the explosion. We can use Type 1a supernovae to measure the distances to objects because they seem to explode in a relatively predictable manner. Their behaviour does not seem to change particularly much, and so they have a predictable brightness, or a predictable luminosity, I should say. We can thus determine the distances to the, these objects by measuring their brightness with telescopes, and then we can measure the redshift of the galaxy in which they reside, and determine the relationship between distance and velocity, and probe the expansion history. This plot just shows a certain parameterization of that expansion, which shows that in the present day universe, or in the last seven billion years of the history of the universe, the rate of expansion of the universe has been accelerating. Um, and this work won Ryan Schmidt from Mount Stromlo and his collaborators um, a share of the Shaw Prize a couple of years ago. This plot incorporates the most distant type 1 supernova, type 1a supernova that we currently know. 
at a redshift of about 1.1, corresponding to around about 9 billion years ago. Over much of this range of cosmic time, the expansion rate of the universe is accelerating under the influence of the mysterious dark energy. If we use GMT to study type 1a supernovae, we can probe their history over an even larger space of cosmic time, perhaps even going out to redshift 8 or 10, and probe the expansion history over 95% of the history of the universe. And we can probe it during an era when gravity from dark matter should dominate, and the expansion of the history, the expansion, sorry, of the uh, universe should be decelerating under the influence of gravity. My own interest in GMT is to study how galaxies, including today's galaxies, grew. Here's a couple of examples of uh, galaxies um, taken with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to galaxies, the elliptical galaxy, I think it's M87, uh, grand design spiral, um, whose messier number I forget at the moment. And we're still trying to work out how such galaxies form. We know that there are two contributing factors to the growth of galaxies. We know that galaxies can grow by forming new stars, and if you take a pair of binoculars and look in the sword of Orion, or if you like the handle of the saucepan, one can see a cloud of gas and a couple of bright stars within it. And new stars are being born in this region of space. The Milky Way is growing by forming new stars. One can also grow galaxies by corporate acquisitions, grabbing smaller galaxies and making them your own. And our own galaxy is doing that as well. This image by Mary Putman and her collaborators using the Parkes Radio Telescope shows the Magellanic Clouds and the Magellanic Stream, a stream of hydrogen gas which has been stripped off these galaxies by the Milky Way. And eventually, perhaps not particularly soon, but eventually, these galaxies will merge with the Milky Way, making us just a little bit more paunchy. Which of these two modes of galaxy growth dominates remains um, an area of significant debate within astronomy. Um, deba debate perhaps verging on shouting match at times. My own contribution to this field is studying the number of galaxies over cosmic time and how they evolve using some of the larger and more capable telescopes um, in the world. The Kitt Peak 4 metre telescope of the National Optical Astronomy Observatory, which Jeremy was the director of some years ago, and the Spitzer Space Telescope, the most capable infrared telescope ever built, or at least until very recently. I've studied the number of galaxies as a function of their intrinsic brightness or luminosity, and I find that there's actually more luminous galaxies in the past than there are today. And this occurs because when you take a population of stars, it gradually fades because massive stars end up uh, dying off relatively quickly. My results tell me that galaxies have not grown particularly much over the past 8 billion years, which is more than half the age of the universe. They've grown by about 30% or so. And so most of the growth of galaxies must have occurred between a redshift of 1 and a redshift of 2, corresponding to about 8 billion to 10 billion years ago, give or take. The upper limit of 10, maybe 11 billion years at a pinch, is set by the fact that that's when the peak of star formation <coughs> occurs. The problem is that galaxies in, that, in this particular range are very hard to measure. We need infrared data to try and see spectral features which have been shifted out of the optical wavelength range into the infrared. And this is extremely difficult with the current generation of telescopes. They struggle even to determine a very crude distance to these galaxies or an age. Whereas with GMT, we'll be able to get exquisite spectra of such galaxies. We'll be able to get spectra of not just the most luminous galaxies at this 
epoch, but also more normal galaxies, galaxies that could be similar to the progenitors of the Milky Way. We can get spectra of galaxies that are young and old, galaxies that are still forming stars vigorously, and galaxies where, for whatever reason, star formation has been turned off. We, of course, get the accurate distances as well, because we can measure very distinct spectral features in these galaxies. For example, in these simulated spectra of distant galaxies here, we can see two dips in the spectra at a wavelength of a little bit under 1.2 microns. And these are the Fraunhofer H and K lines that one can see in the spectrum of the Sun and that one sees in the spectra of many galaxies um, that are either old or sort of middle-aged. We can measure how quickly these galaxies are forming stars and we can measure how old these galaxies are. And so this will provide us with a wealth of information about how galaxies have grown and how the progenitors of today's galaxies have grown. Apart from the spectroscopy of the galaxies, there is also the imaging of the galaxies, which is really a tremendous improvement upon what is possible with telescopes that are cursed with just the imaging that's provided by the natural scene. So, these three images show simulations of a galaxy, in fact a copy of the Antenna galaxy, um, shifted out to a redshift of around about 3, uh, around about 11 to 12 billion light years from Earth. If we view it with a telescope, a current day telescope, cursed with the turbulence of the atmosphere, though admittedly on a very good night with half arc second C, we just see a blob. There's really nothing we can tell from this um, in terms of the structure of this galaxy. However, with two modes of adaptive optics used that will be available with the Giant Magellan Telescope, we have a tremendous improvement. With the highest resolution adaptive optics, which uses a laser to create an artificial star 100 kilometres above the Earth, we can achieve very high resolution and we can see knots of star formation strung, up, strung out along a tidal tail, a classic indication of emerging galaxy. We can also use a lower resolution mode, which also gets some of the features. We can see some of the star clusters in the tail. And this lower resolution mode, known as ground layer adaptive optics, where one only corrects for the atmospheric turbulence that is close to the ground, allows you to obtain a somewhat degraded image, but over a much larger chunk of sky. A chunk of sky that in diameter is around about a third of the diameter of the Moon. And with this high resolution imaging, this will allow us to tell us if galaxies at high redshift are growing via mergers, or perhaps they're just growing very rapidly via star formation alone. It should also be noted, and this will be discussed more by Brian Boyle in a couple of weeks, that there are fantastic synergies between the GMT and the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, shown here, and the eventual Square Kilometre Array. The Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder and the SKA are going to be tremendous radio telescopes able to survey out for um, uh, a neutral hydrogen out to significant redshift. In particular, the Square Kilometre Array is going to be able to study neutral hydrogen over much of the history of the universe. 